Ladies and gentlemen, this is TVP World. You're watching another edition of Break the Fake, where we debunk fake news and combat false narratives. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee, and let's get rolling. Now watch out, guys. The Kremlin trolls are trying to sway the European Parliament elections again. Czech counterintelligence has revealed a Russian operative network that was tasked with influencing the results of the upcoming vote. According to Czech media, the network had operatives working in six countries. Poland, Hungary, Germany, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. The revelations were followed by immediate sanctions targeting Viktor Medvedchuk and Artem Mechevsky, Ukrainian entrepreneurs and politicians closely linked with the Kremlin regime. Sanctions were also placed on Medvedchuk's company, Voice of Europe, registered in the Czech Republic to a Polish national. However, no other details have been disclosed at the time of this recording. Journalist with the independent Czech daily, Danik N, who spoke with sources familiar with the case, wrote that politicians from the German far-right Alternative for Germany party received dark money from their contacts in Prague. Similar handouts were also given to politicians from other European countries. Without going into the details, the sources apparently said that the politicians came from all six countries the network was active in. We're going to keep you updated on this story as it develops. Now, according to a sniper, working with AFU, the conflict in Ukraine will be frozen this year or in early 2025. In an interview, the shooter, Kosai Grandpa, said that all major battlefield operations will run their course by the year's end, first half of 2025 at the latest. Which is why the Russian Federation will be looking to launch another mass mobilization to grab as much of Ukraine as possible. Поэтому мы прекрасно понимаем, что они соберут там 100 тысяч, 300 тысяч, там сколько надо, они соберут. Это не проблема для них. Они, естественно, будут идти в наступление, потому что то, о чем ты говорил в самом начале, я действительно верю, что основные все события будут решаться в этом году, до конца этого года, на поле боя. Я думаю, что максимум в первой половине 25 -го года Будет, мне даже это сложно слово сказать э, правильно, это не перемирие, но будет некая э, заморозка активных действий на фронте, как это было в принципе по линии АТО э, в свое время. То есть я думаю, что это может произойти или до конца 2024 -го года, или в худшем случае в дальней перспективе первая половина 25-го. Поэтому, естественно, э, для них очень важно... Сейчас провести достаточно большую мобилизацию, пригнать людей на фронт для того, чтобы они могли к этому времени попытаться взять себе как можно больше. The Ukrainian news website Krim.Relia is saying that Moscow's new wave of mobilization for the Russian armed forces will commence April 1st. Up until now, military-aged men living in Crimea managed to evade being pressed into service. But new draft rules have now made it nearly impossible. Moscow pushed upper age limit from 27 to 30 years old and switched to electronic draft summons, which have made evasion very difficult. With the new draft rules in place, Moscow really seems to be gearing up for mass mobilization. The Kremlin's propaganda machine is working overtime to indoctrinate the youth in the occupied peninsula to get it to enlist with NASHI, a paramilitary youth organization that numerous media outlets are already mockingly calling it Putin's youth. And intelligence services of NATO countries are warning of plans for a major Russian offensive. Now let's hope the plans never come to fruition because Russia's frontline achievements are not exactly stellar right now. Despite staggering personnel and supply woes, the Ukrainians are still holding out, preventing the Russians from advancing and forcing them into expanding precious ordnance and sending waves upon waves of soldiers in hopeless assaults. But on television, Russia is doing great. In front of the cameras, Kremlin's clowns are spinning their yarns as fast as they can, and in his own feverish fantasies, Solovyev has destroyed the world at least twice over. After crossing the globe, sowing death and destruction, he found his way back to the front line. But it's something must have happened in the meantime, because his threats of annihilation, the vid against Kharkiv and Kyiv, seem to be somewhat humbler. Они должны быть иллюзии. 48 часов всем покинуть Харьков и по квартально сносить к чертовой матери. Вот не надо больше ничего говорить. Любые наши проявления взаимопонимания, братья, сестры. Воспринимается ими как слабость. 
Все наши уже здесь. Все, кто нам братья, уже здесь. Они нашли способ перейти границу. И они покинули. Объясните мне, почему вообще Киев стоит? Почему этот нацистский город до сих пор стоит? Мать городов русских давно захвачена врагами. Они нацисты. Они лавру захватили. Они осквернили все святыни. И народ Киева это легко воспринял и предал. Сначала память о Великой Отечественной войне, потом православие. Что еще они должны предать? The Russian army has also proven itself surprisingly apt at uh, destroying its own equipment and resources. After all, they have been repeatedly boasting that the fires breaking out across their military installations had been caused by malfunction or accident. This is deliberate, of course, and it's supposed to convince the Russian people that it's all just a mishap and nothing wrong. In Russia, there's a big difference between who's doing the arson, foreigners or Russians themselves. There's no way that any foreigner could set fire to an oil processing facility or hurt a Russian on their home turf, right? So in this coming video, what you'll see is most likely an accident. Take a look at a Russian tank suddenly drive out of a field and come across a true God-fearing Russian in his car. <laughs> And yesterday, we've seen Belarusian strongman Lukashenko with a small dog on his lap like a Bond villain spin tales to his military commanders that taking the Sovalki Gap in Poland and linking up with the Russian forces in the Kaliningrad exclave will not pose any problem to the Minsk regime forces. This only testifies to his staggering ignorance of military affairs and conclusions drawn from the war in Ukraine, as well as his lack of knowledge about the actual military capabilities of the Russian and Belarusian armies compared to that of NATO forces. Lukashenko's March 26 visit to one of the forward battalions exercising in the Ashmiani district near the Lithuanian caused quite the ruckus in the media. And the reports didn't focus on a visit as much as on how the Belarusian dictator carried himself and what he said during a briefing with his generals. Surprisingly, the man who has been relying solely on political terror to control a country that has little actual international standing and is inches away from being absorbed by the Russian Federation is starting to act like a grand monarch. And his gestures are starting to resemble those of Napoleon Bonaparte. Militarized rhetoric has also been making the rounds in the Balkans as of late. A recent post on the official Instagram account of Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic shows a screenshot from a messaging app. The message bubble in the picture says, At this moment, it's difficult to talk about the news we've been getting over the past 48 hours. These are direct threats to the vital interests of Serbia and Republika Srpska. In the coming days, I'll introduce the people of Serbia to all the challenges that lie ahead. It will be difficult. War. War never changes. Nowadays, European countries and their people have grown used to watching war only on television, but the balance of power is shifting. And the last time tensions ran this high in this part of the globe was before World War II. So let's pray that war never comes to our doorstep again and remains confined to the series we watch on streaming platforms. And with that, we conclude this edition of Break the Fake. But for more news, update, and commentary, please stay tuned to TVP World.